Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and my guest today is Patrick Wombold, Solutions Architect for Media and Entertainment. How's it going, man? It's all good. I'm excited to have yeah. you on the show. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, finally get on one of these. So uh, <laughs> it's good. It's good timing. Yeah, just in time for Christmas. So. And you awesome. prepped some really cool stuff to show us today. We are going to talk a little bit about the DMX plugin in uh, 426. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that we kind of initially put in into 425 as an experimental feature. And then finally in 426, we're out of experimental. I believe it's still marked as beta, but we can still consider it, we consider it uh, ready for production use. So really excited to show some stuff about it. The floor is all yours. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah. So, um, and again, thanks for having me. I, I, I always love the stuff you guys put out. So hopefully this will uh, be as, be as interesting to uh, some other people as, uh, as it is to me. So um, just a little bit of background on, on me and kind of like how this you know, what DMX is used for. Like I came from live entertainment. So anytime you go to like a concert or event like that, or if you're at a theme park or, you know, most of the cases when you're seeing lighting being done in, in a setting like that, it's being controlled through DMX. So if you don't, if you don't know what it is, um, that's kind of like the general background is it's used, it's a protocol used to control lights. And so we put in some support for it. Um, just on like a protocol level and also created some example fixtures as well as the newest thing in 426 is actually the pixel mapping. So I'm going to show hopefully all of that today <laughs> if we have enough time for it. And um, uh, yeah, I'll be looking forward to also hopefully answering some questions because I know we got a lot of kind of passionate people in that live events community, especially with the state of things this year in 2020. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, so I, I guess like the, the, the first part, um, and I guess my, my desktop is visible, right? I just want to make Yes, <laughs> sir, right. it looks good. Uh, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, enabling it is actually super simple. Um, and I would assume most people that, like, if you have some kind of interest in this, you kind of already know this part, but there's actually like four parts to it. Um, so the engine and the protocol are the two main parts. Uh, the fixtures themselves are just if you're going to do like visualization inside the engine, they're just kind of some examples. And then pixel mapping is just the, the newest kind of uh, feature that we pushed um, out. It should allow you to take either a texture or material or something like that and actually send DMX from the engine um, using it. So you just need to enable all these. It'll prompt you for a restart. I've already done that. Uh, so it's not gonna, I don't have to do it again. Um, and then once you come back, you'll actually notice a couple things about uh, your layout that might be a little different. So you'll you'll get this little toolbar um, icon at the top here, and so this will kind of be your main kind of uh, control point for as far as I/O in DMX. So if you like take it down, you have options to pause sending and receiving. So this is actually extremely helpful if you're doing stuff like recording in and you want to just play back. Um, you don't want to have like a conflict with something else that's on the network. Um, but this also gives you access to the monitoring tools. So I actually have one of them that I kind of usually keep just docked down here, but you know, it's a dockable window. You can put it anywhere you want. Um, and this, so this will give you a readout of either coming in or going out or, um, on a universe. Um, you can pick which protocol it is, um, but it's just like a single universe at a time. That one's pretty cool, but then uh, our, some, our internal team came up with this other one, the activity monitor, which I think actually gives you a lot more information, um, but it shows you just kind of like every universe that like just what's happening, but only the channels that are actually being uh, affected. So it's actually just a nice way to see like, oh, okay, like stuff's coming in or stuff's going out, like, and, and where is it? Because sometimes there is uh, some discrepancy on, you know, okay, are you sending it on the right one? And so now you can just kind of see all of them with I mean, just tick between them. So it's that is super helpful. Um, and then the last thing uh, that they kind of added in was this output console. And really this like wasn't designed to be um, a control surface, so to speak. It was really meant just to kind of quickly test things. So if you were like, had some uh, real life fixtures and you just kind of wanted to quickly like send something to it, like that was kind of the purpose of it. Um, but since then, you know, it's kind of, it's definitely kind of evolved a little bit. Um, but still, like, that's kind of the point is, like, it's really meant as a debug thing. You're not really, um, it wasn't designed to, like, control fixtures in, in, in any meaningful way. Um, but it's pretty handy if you're just trying to quickly, like, bounce through some things. Um, 
So, so those are kind of like the main parts of just the, I guess the toolbar set. But um, in addition to that, there's also uh, a couple of new asset types that you get, and it's pretty, um, you know, I hate to say self-explanatory because that that usually means it isn't. Um, but <laughs> if you right-click, you'll um, uh, to add content into your content browser, you can actually create a DMX, you have DMX library, which was similar to how it was in 425. We had that as well. Uh, and then you have this new pixel mapping um, asset type as well. So I've already created a ton of like libraries that you know I was um, using for some of my demo stuff. This is just some, um, you know, f uh, just kind of a little playground that I've been using. Um, but I'll, I kind of wanted to go through this process and just show it kind of from start to finish, like how you would do it if you have never done it before. So hopefully I'll, this will, we have some good docs online now, but still like it's, sometimes it's just nice to see kind of going through it. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just create a new one and I'm gonna, you know, just name it something nice. So we'll call this live uh, and there. So once we open it up, we'll get a window kind of like this. Um, there may or may not be like an extra, like because you can have other windows in it, but these are the three main ones that you need. So depending on if you did a fresh install, you might see like an extra window, but these are the three ones that you need. Um, so the first thing we want to do is define what our input output is going to be. So we're going to just, you know, tell uh, Unreal, you know, how are we going to get DMX in and out of the system? So we give it, uh, there's a couple of you know options in here. If you're familiar with DMX, these should seem very familiar. Um, that if you're not, um, basically we support two protocols, Artnet and SACN. We give options as far as broadcast or unicast. Uh, if you go to SACN, we also have multicast as an option um, since it's supported. Um, but I tend to just use Artnet because I, it's just what I've used forever, and I can generally get it to work. Um, and then here we're going to define like what universes we're going to send out. Because if uh, I think most people are familiar with this, but if not, DMX is kind of subdivided into universes and channels. And so you generally have to tell it like exactly what you want to talk to. You know, so we'll give it a universe number and a channel number. So this is where we're going to tell it, okay, what universes are we actually going to use? Because there's 64,000 possible ones. We don't want to send them all, let's just send the ones we need. Um, so I'll tell it, here's the one we're going to start with, uh, the amount, so whatever, we'll just put in 10. Uh, and then what we can kind of remap where we want this to go on the other end. So for example, if I wanted to actually send it to universe 20, I could make an adjustment here. Odds are good for easy stuff. You'll just leave it the same, but this can come in handy, especially like with Artnet. You can actually send it to Artnet 0 if you want. Um, but I just like to leave it one because that's easier to deal with. Uh, so you'll notice I have a little warning here. This is kind of a new thing that just to tell people that, hey, you have another library that you have overlapping values on, right? Because you can create as many of these as you want. Um, and so to kind of give people an idea of like, you know, hey, you might have a conflict. You might be trying to send two things to the same place. So this will tell you which other libraries have overlapping addresses, so it's pretty nice. Um, if you pick, um, uh, you know, so if I were actually to move this, you know, somewhere much further away, um, it goes away, right? Because now it's not overlapping anymore. Um, there's nothing wrong with overlapping per se, but it's just to give you an idea. <laughs> like, hey, you might not want to do that. You might already have something that you that you're already working with. Um, so I'll use just this for now. And then the next section is kind of where you define what types of fixtures you're going to use. So this is something that is kind of somewhat exclusive to if you're going to use Unreal as more like a previs style thing. So if you wanted to uh, kind of design like a stage set and um, you know kind of use a console and something like that, and you would want to actually like control lights with a with a board, like that's where you would kind of define like, okay, what fixture types am I wanting to talk to and where are they like address? So this is kind of what um, we came up for this. So it's a little bit different than the old patching system. Again, if you're used to a console, all these things will probably be familiar, um, but I'll just kind of quickly go through it. So if you create a new fixture type, 
um, it just comes up with a generic DMX fixture type. Um, and then you can either do one of two things. You can either just kind of specify it manually, what you want it to be, or we also support um, what we call uh, an industry standard called GDTF. GDTF is uh, an open protocol that, we're, um, that we participate with and support um, that kind of has a common set of defined properties for lights. Um, so right now we only actually support the uh, like channel step and channel information. We don't actually like import the models or anything like that um, yet, but that's something that hopefully will be in future releases. But for now, this is just to kind of help define what are the properties of the light and you know kind of what what can we do with it. So hmm. thirsty today. So um, I have a few um, GDCFs that. I had it imported already. I'll show how to use that um, in a second, but first I'll just show how to make like a really basic light. So the most basic light is probably like an RGB light plus a dimmer. Um, and so that would be something kind of like one of these guys, right? Just like a little LED par, um, you know, it's three channels um, and a dimmer channel. And that's kind of probably the most basic fixture anymore. Um, and so you can, when you come down to the settings of it, you have kind of a way to specify what category it is. Um, these don't really mean anything. You can put them all in static if you want. Uh, it's just more for grouping. So if you wanted to do sorting later, you could say, OK, give me all the static heads. Give me all the moving heads, um, something like that. Um, so then after that, you kind of just like, so it kind of goes down, uh, down, kind of like moving across this way. Uh, Lights can have different modes, so you can define different mode types here. So we'll literally just say this is, you know, whatever, four channel mode in this case. Um, and then you can define from there what things should the light do, right? So we'll add four functions here. So functions on the left are really honestly not super important uh, if you're creating them from scratch. They're more important if you're actually importing them, because um, that's what what you import from the GTF will kind of populate the functions, and then you have to assign those internally to what we would consider our attributes. So we kind of define a certain like a certain number of attributes that we just consider common. Like a light would have intensity, a light would have uh, color, a light might be able to pan or tilt. So we, um, you know, we're able to. Uh, add to that list, but we just give people like a predefined list. Oh, that's going to kill me. All right, so <laughs> hot tip. Don't use auto Hot type. tip. <laughs> or increase the, <laughs> decrease the frequency. So um, yeah, all right. Save manually. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be much happier. <laughs> so, um, but, so, so we have these kind of predefined, like so when you click the drop down, there'll be a list of them. Uh, but you can add to this list, and I'll show you kind of where that is here once I get through the last section. So I'm just going to pat since it's a very simple fixture. Um, so now I have everything assigned. We're all good. And then down here, you can define what, you know, some other, I guess, smaller details about each function, because um, DMX can be either 8-bit, 16, 24, or technically 32, and probably beyond. I've never really seen anything above 24 honestly. Um, but you can change those here. You can also swap the, so in 16-bit mode, you can either have most significant or least significant. So the port one can come first or second. So if you need to swap it, you would swap it here. Uh, if you need to offset where the channel step is, you can also do that here. Um, but for the most part, we're just going to try and keep it simple. All right. So essentially, this is a complete light. <laughs> like now it's, it's, uh, it's been defined what it is, and we've you know, we've got all the parts we need. The last step is to then just like add it to the patch. So uh, my good friends at Geodesic did a great job making this like some of the best like uh, UI, <laughs> I think, in the engine. <laughs> and so they uh, made it so that, you know, now when you add a light, so hot tip, if you want to duplicate a lot of these, number it first. And then when you duplicate them, you'll get a nice incrementing number, <laughs> which I find extremely handy. Um, but they populate with these little bubbles over here on the left. So by default, uh, they auto assign. So it'll just increment, you know, so if you keep going, it'll just kind of keep patching to the next available. 
Um, but if you wanted to, you could actually just go and drag this around and move it to a new patch. It automatically turns off auto assign at this point. Um, but you could always, uh, you know, whatever. I could just drag it back in and take it back on if I wanted to keep uh, having them shuffle. You can also change the colors of the buttons. So maybe we'll go with like a nice, you know, kind of red and green look for Christmas. That's a pretty bad red, actually. <laughs> but uh, you get the idea. Um, so, and then that you can kind of just use that. It's really just visual at that point. Um, you can change what universe you're looking at. Uh, if you attempt to put something into a universe that we didn't define, because uh, earlier we only said we're going to use 10, um, it'll tell you, like, hey, warning, this is actually outside of this. You, we can't get to it. And then it'll tell you also up here, unreachable by controller, meaning that we don't have enough, like we should have set this to 20. Um, so it's pretty pretty robust, actually, system for patching things together. And then at this point, you know, we have 10 lights that Unreal is, you know, ready to deal with if we wanted, if we wanted to use them. Um, so kind of backtracking just to cover some other things that I kind of glossed over. I mentioned that these attributes here, we can add more of them. So where you would do that actually is inside your project settings. So if you go, once the plugin's enabled and you scroll down, you'll have this DMX plugin section and you have these uh, options here that we give you. So the first one is what interface are you gonna use? So if you leave it on zero, it's gonna pick whatever your Windows primary uh, is. Um, this is generally, what I like to use, uh, that way I have to think less about it. Um, but if you click the drop down now, instead of giving you something to type in, it's going to find all of the ones that you have. So like this is one of my ethernets, this is another one, this is like our VPN, and then we have like local loopback. Um, but zero will just pick like your primary one. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's pretty handy. You can also set like a global offset on universes. So if you needed to just move everything down for some reason, um, you can do that there. Um, but here's also where we have the categories and the attributes, right? So those static, those categories that I showed that are here, you can actually define more of them if you wanted to. So you could use that for grouping or whatever. Um, and then, uh, right, the attributes, right? So this is where we could define uh, whether we want to use red, green, blue, like what are these words? And so what this keyword is in here is that we notice kind of when coming from GDTFs, um, they have something in the uh, order of like 280 or something like that types of attributes that they support, um, which is a lot. And a lot of them are very similar, um, you know, in, in a lot of cases. And so we tried to make it easier so that if you bring one in, it will smartly look for these words. And then if it finds one of them, it will automatically map it to the attribute type. So it's quite a time saver um, because, uh, you know, if, if the wording is like slightly off or, you know, or, you know, looking for, you know, just, uh, it, it just would take a long time to map. So um, you can add more of those. Like I said, it's just, you know, as simple as adding a new one and just making a new uh, field, uh, super simple stuff. And then lastly, we have some settings about what should we do with um, refresh rate. So by default, DMX runs at 44 hertz. Um, you can restrict that, or I guess if you really wanted to make it go faster, <laughs> I don't see any real point to that. Um, but uh, certain consoles and certain like older nodes like do run at like different rates. And so we give you kind of just a global um, setting for that. These send and receive by default, what this actually controls is in here, we have a setting for, you know, we can pause, send, and receive. Um, but, you know, if I like tick this off, like this isn't necessarily going to package like with it off, right? You know, and, and we can tell it, you know, through blueprints or code to, to send or receive. Um, um, but you actually just have a setting here where you can say, okay, you know what? I don't want you to send by default. <laughs> like, unless I tell you to. Don't do it. Same thing with receive. Um, so by default, they're both checked, which means you know as soon as you hit play, like it's assuming both will be working. Um, but there could be some cases for sure, like if you record it into a sequencer, like I don't want it to receive by default. I just want to play back like what I'm looking at. Um, 
so um, that's all the settings that we have for it at this point. Um, and so then I'll yeah pop back over to the patch. So I mentioned this idea of using um, importing a GTF file. And what these are, like, um, we can maybe post a link, but it's gtf sharecom And again, it's like an open uh, source database of, of these fixture types. So I have brought a few of them. Like, I already have a few, so I'll just use one that I already had. So we're just going to use like a, a Beamulite. Um, well, actually, I guess technically it is it's, it is a Sharpie. <laughs> so, because Beamy is another type. Um, so I'll use the import here, and I already so I'd already dropped the file in, but literally just drag it into the content browser. Um, and so I'm going to use this one uh, just because I know that it works. So I'll set my uh, category to moving head. Um, it's not a matrix. And then so you can see the two modes that already came in, so standard and vector. Uh, and you know it automatically detected how many channels are in it. It set up a, you know, and it did the mapping for me for all the ones that it understands. So if there's one of these that says select value, that means we don't have something currently for that. Um, so we're going to, uh, you know, you can either pick something or if it's something that you don't think you would use internally, um, you can just leave it blank. So if, again, for something like fixture mode or maybe global reset or lamp control, like these aren't things that you're actually going to visualize. So there's not necessarily a reason to assign them, but you can if you want to. Um, and same thing, it detects if it's 8-bit or if it's 16-bit, like it already determined these things. And it also should read the default values um, from the GTF as well. So if you are working with real lights and there is a GTF, it's insanely easy. <laughs> um, if you are working with a light that doesn't have one, it's not too hard to create your own, um, but it does you know, maybe take a little bit more. So um, I see stuff like blowing up in the chat, <laughs> like just out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> so it's funny. Um, all right, so the last part of this that I'll kind of go over as far as patching is we added support for matrix fixtures um, in 26 as well. This is something that wasn't in 25. So if I add a new type and uh, let's just, I don't know, let's just say it's an LED strip light um, or whatever. Let's do a five by five matrix, like a like a cupex or something. So I didn't have a profile for that. So I'll show you kind of just how easy to make one. So again, this category doesn't necessarily matter, but just for the sake of being thorough, I'll put it in this category. But this is the checkbox you do need. This tell, tells Unreal internally, like, yes, we want to use uh, a matrix style for this type thing. So when I add this one, I'll get a different kind of look in these two windows. Um, and the reason being, like, a matrix is essentially just like, a lot of copies of the same thing. So rather than having to define like red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, over and over and over again, you can just define it once and tell it how many cells it has. Um, so in this case, we'll just say this is, you know, RGB mode. Um, and then we can tell it how many cells are in it. So we're going to go with five by five. And then this is kind of the sorting distribution because if you imagine a five by five grid, you know, it could go up and down, it could snake side to side, it could go in rows. Um, so this is almost every conceivable <laughs> combination except maybe like a weird spiral or something. I don't know. I've never seen one like that. But, and then you tell it what are the cell attributes that are in each one. So it'd go through and say, okay, this one is uh, gonna be our red. This one is gonna be our green. And this one will be our blue. And so then you'll see over here on the right, we're kind of getting some different information where it says, okay, we're starting at one, we have 75 elements of, you know, so 25 times three gives us our 75, right? Now, some fixtures also have like extra uh, control channels that will sit in front or behind of like the main thing. So you still can add those. Uh, currently, though, there is a limitation that we only support um, uh, them on the front, so before the matrix things. If you and it's kind of giving me a warning right now, like something's going on, like you have an overlap here, um, and that's because I told this guy it starts on one. When in reality, if I have 
a dimmer there. It probably it should start on too. Um, but what I what I'm I guess talking about is if I wanted this to actually be channel 77 and come after these, right now we can't actually do that. Um, it can only be before. So it's something we're going to fix, but just to kind of keep that out there. But again, this is somewhat unique. It doesn't happen a lot, but just in case you run into it. So I'm actually going to delete this because it's just, to me, it's just extra junk. And we'll save this. So now we have one matrix, one moving head, and one static picture. Um, and we can use this to pop into the world and actually play with these things. Um, I think that was mostly everything in there. Oh, well, I should patch them. Right. So if I don't patch them, I won't be able to use them for anything. So we'll add in our Sharpie. Uh, so we'll just add one of these guys and put in a 5x5 five five matrix. And the only reason I number them like this is so that way if I want to make more and you duplicate them, they just increment nicely. Um, so to make it easier, just visually uh, we'll do that. So there we go. All right. So um, that's, you know, it, and obviously if you're a lighting person, probably done lots of patching in your life. You understand how this works. You'll add a bunch more of these and you'll you know, populate your show that way. So if we kind of come back out to the the viewport and look at then, okay, well, that's great. We have a patch. Like now, how do we like do something with it? Um, so one of the, you know, if we enable in the plugins, the DMX fixtures content, we actually ship some pretty good um, example fixtures. So we give an example of um, a moving head, a moving matrix style. Uh, there's a moving mirror, which is, I actually, Rarely ever used uh, the static LED, a strobe, a uh, matrix, and a wash LED type light. And I can kind of go through kind of what makes these a little bit different and unique. But um, you know, our, our one of our TAs, uh, Francis. Big big shout out to Francis because <laughs> he did just an awesome job making these things come to life. Um, and uh, not only that, but he put in some nice little tools and nice little things to kind of make it easier. So in the previous version, uh, in 4.26, um, it was kind of like a big Uber blueprint that kind of drove these things. And it was almost more like a proof of concept, I suppose. Um, and now it's kind of turned into its own system. There's a DMX actor type, like, a, you know, there's a class for it. Um, and all the different things you can do are components. So we wanted to kind of make it easier uh, for people to kind of create their own variants and versions of things. because. Um, Part of you know what makes you know lights interesting is like that they you know they don't all do the same thing. Like when you look at this one, it has different capabilities than this one does. And so trying to define all of those, I mean, there's literally probably millions of light types out there. Um, it's kind of daunting. So we wanted to kind of make this a nice system that people could work on their own and kind of develop their own libraries or possibly maybe some. Uh, entrepreneurial type will create one in the marketplace. <laughs> so if uh, anybody's got a lot of free time and you know wants to do that, uh, I, I think it's a valid uh, a valid thing. So um, it might might be something to look into. But um, but again, I, so I'll I'll show kind of how the structure works and kind of show some hopefully some more fun stuff. Mm. All right. So if you are just kind of browsing through the thing. And again, if you don't see that for some reason, um, you may be missing engine content or plugin content, right? So if you need, uh, if you don't see it. So I'll just, um, actually what I'll do, I'll just start a new level and I mean, don't muck up this one. And I'll sh show everybody my super secret sauce of how I make an awesome level. I literally just add in the HDRI backdrop. <laughs> so another another nice uh, another nice tool that kind of came. Do you a still have to ago. turn on the the uh, yeah? For that? That's yeah, that's a plugin stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's still, it is a plugin. And now there's actually some more like I've noticed there's some nice uh, cute map textures that kind of came. I don't remember what version it is. I like the ambient sunset. It just kind of I feel like usually what we're doing is always dark, um, and then maybe I'll bump that down and. Uh, I always feel like I end up putting this like kind of low because lights work in the dark, right? 
So if I just drag one in from scratch, like this is kind of what I'll get. So, um, and we'll put them back at zero. And actually, we just I want them to sit on the floor, right? Um, so this is kind of what'll what'll pop in. And by itself, like it's not going to um, do anything because we haven't told it, you know, hey, which address are you? So all that stuff we did in the patch earlier, we have to tell the fixture, you know, which one you are. Um, so I only added one, so I'll just I'll leave it at, at one for right now. Um, and I guess in the future we could maybe add in a couple more of these guys. But um, so we have one of those. We had, if I remember correctly, ten of these, right? Uh, I do this and do that. Uh, and then we had one matrix, right? Um, and so that's kind of what, what I made in my little uh, pseudo patch there. So looking at this uh, in the details panel, and um, you can kind of see that kind of the structure that we kind of came up with for this. So inside the, you know, this part just being the actual like meshes and the like nesting order of it. And then you have these components that kind of define what can this fixture do? So we again, this is just an example one. I happen to know it just matches with the Sharpie put footprint. That's why I use it. But if you were using a different light, it's not necessarily going to check out the box because you have to tell it what kind of parameters does it have, right? And actually, like this isn't even one hundred percent accurate for Sharpie because Sharpies don't have zoom <laughs> in real life. Um, but I like to use it, so mine does. Um, but so these are all kind of in, I guess, in, in this case, inherited um, because we just give you this like one example. But you could literally just remake this on your own if you were super inclined. Um, so for example, if I um, create a new folder, we'll just say like a new fixture. Um, you know, if I were actually to go in here and create a new blueprint um, and search for DMX, you can you have this DMX fixture actor, and you also have this DMX fixture actor matrix. Um, so I could literally just go in here, do one of these, and literally build it from scratch if I wanted to. It comes with the hierarchy, it comes with the DMX component, but then I can manually add all those components if I wanted to. Um, I honestly think that is a really long way to do it. So unless you have a super, um, you know, useful reason for doing that, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, let me say this in case something bad happens. <laughs> um, I also wouldn't recommend naming it new blueprint. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I probably wouldn't do that. So, and also, you know, that being said, I also probably wouldn't drag these directly out of the engine content into the level. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, but mostly, Anything that's in here is subject to updates and changes, and it's also local. So if I drag this out and then I edit like this master blueprint and send this to somebody else, it's not going to use my changes. It's going to use whatever's in their local engine content. So not best practice necessarily to drag them all out. So like what what is the best way to do this, right? So um, you kind of have two options. One is that you can either make a copy of it and put it in your local directory. This is great if you know you're going to make like certain changes that you know are going to be exclusive and you only want to have them. Um, the other option is to make a child, and this is kind of the one that I recommend. So what you do is you right so right click on it, create a child class, um, and then we'll just say, okay, this is going to be my um, live stream Sharpie, right? And so by making it a child, um, what I'm essentially doing is I'm able to use all that are inside the main one, but able to make local changes. Also, if we happen to, whatever, find a bug in the fixture, something's broken, we update it, we push that in, you know, in the next version, since it's still inheriting, you'll get those changes. Now, that's not 100% across the board. Like, I want, I want to make that, like, very clear. Like, there are, it's possible that, you know, something in blueprint like if we change how a blueprint node works you may have to re you know connect some wires but for the most part it's going to all um uh update nicely and i also just like this because then like you kind of, you have this nice level of inheritance right like it's one of the powerful things about unreal that i think maybe is not 
as well understood and used sometimes. Um, but if I were to then make a change to this, like it would then filter down to everything. So this kind of gets treated as like just what it is as a parent, right? It's my parent class. But I can then override it, you know, with things locally. Um, and then from there, you know, every time I drag one of these out, I can make even more fine tuned changes. So it kind of just gives you like a level of like, I guess, control and structure. So, so what I recommend is I actually make a different uh, child class for every type of light that I'm going to be using. Um, so for example, if uh, in addition to this Sharpie, if this wasn't the only moving head that I had, and I actually had uh, a different one um, that was, you know, whatever. Let's just say this one was a beamy. I don't remember how to spell it. Um, you know, these two lights are going to have different properties, right? They're going to have different zoom values. They're going to have different max intensities. They may have different things. So in order to define that nicely, I'm going to make two different um, uh, child classes. So if I duplicate this one over, and I was to say, OK, this one is a beamy. Um, now I can define these separately. So I can say, OK, you know, Sharpie, your max intensity is actually more. These are in candelas, so just know that. Um, and we could say, all right, this uh, this beamy light, you actually um, don't go that high. We'll leave you at default 2000, or whatever it is. And so that way, I can kind of have two different versions of this, but they all have the same functionality. Um, and then I could even make it even more granular inside the editor if I wanted to, and I could have two identical copies and just say, okay, you're going to run at high quality and you're going to run at low quality. And so um, it's just really, really nice to be able to like make kind of global changes, <laughs> and and that's how to, how you kind of do it at the class level. Um, so that might have been a long explanation, but well, it's I important. That, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's it's again, it's one of those things where. If you make these decisions earlier, you will run into less problems later. <laughs> and it's sure. something that when you're like, yeah, when you're like, how do I affect all, all of them? And then you're like, oh shoot, <laughs> it's an engine content, um, that kind of thing. Something right. a programmer so we have our... would learn immediately, right? What's that? Something a programmer would learn immediately, right? But if you come into the engine yeah. s, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, creative... Sometimes I feel like, yeah, when I'm talking to like a comp sci major, they're like, well, duh, <laughs> you know, and like, I'm like, yeah, you got to remember, most of our people like you know so they 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 don't know this and myself included you know that was uh i didn't know a lot of this stuff prior prior to working you know in unreal and, and, and in game engines in general um so so we have our um you know our our sharpie light so now we have our, our proper um you know child but just in the interest of time <laughs> uh so i don't keep making copies of things and you guys just watch me copy uh i'll just use these ones out of here um you just know that's kind of a no-no usually. Um, so we got those back, and then we got our static matrix back. Um, so now I want to be able to tell it like what, you know, what these things do, who they are, that kind of kind of deal. So um, I, I know just because I've done this for, I've been working on DMX for like a year now, I just know these things are going to work, but I'll, I'll show you why, why I know that, <laughs> I guess. So this one, like the reason this one I know is going to work is because it matches the channel step and it has the right components that, that match what I did inside uh, my patch. So like I know it has these things on it. So by default, um, this one comes up a lot at sh like a Sharpie just has a color wheel <laughs> like there's no color mixing on it whereas a lot of modern lights do have some sort of color mixing so um, if I wanted that functionality I would have to modify this and add it to it um, or you know do something else so I'll show how that works but first let's just go with like the default right um, but the most important thing I need to tell this thing um, really is you know what is what is the patch reference that follows this right? So I made that one, uh, it was called live stream, right? And then when I select it, here are the fixtures that I kind of patched earlier. So I'll just put it on Sharpie one. And then technically that guy is like good to go now. Um, so you can kind of get this idea that this could actually be a fairly slow process. <laughs> if you have hundreds of these things to kind of go in here and, uh, and you know, have to manually tell it each time, you know, where is it? Um, so we don't actually ship this with the engine, but 
I made this kind of publicly available and it's a nice little utility widget and it's very, very simple. I won't go into too much how it works, but um, essentially I can grab all of these fixtures in order. So it's gonna go in selection order as best I can tell. Um, and I can try and I can patch all these things in one go. So I have to tell it first what library and what is the first fixture that I'm gonna use. And then I can say, okay, address them incrementally, like go to the next one each time or address them all the same as this one. Or I can do address and rename, which is nice because then it's gonna grab the name out of the patch also and rename it in the world, um, which is more than likely what I want. <laughs> so um, all that really does though, it's just a fancy, um, you know, for it for each loop <laughs> essentially um, but going through and it's just going to go through and incrementally do each one of them so super handy but you could always just go and do it manually and same thing with this matrix you know i i, I just go in and i could do it manually and just pick a uh, live stream and matrix it does the same thing um so just a couple of things to note on the 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 structure of these um because it is a little different than the old version. Uh, previously, like you didn't see the patch on the root. Like you actually had to scroll down and click on the component. Like we we now have that uh, available on the root. You have these options as far as quality level. So in this version, um, Francis again can't say thank you enough. Uh, went through and got rid of the old um, system where we were basically just using like a like a mesh for the to kind of create the beam shape and wrote a really cool raymarched uh, solution. So you get a much, much just like better quality look to it. Um, but that has definitely a cost, right? Uh, so you can kind of define here, how many samples do you want to use for it, right? So if you are, you know, incredibly far away from the light, it's almost visually indistinguishable <laughs> between low and high. So depending on where they are in your, uh, in your um, uh, stream, or I'm sorry, in your like uh, in your venue, like you may want, um, you know, you may just want to do that for performance reasons, right? So you can define that. Um, you can define the light intensity max, the distance. So the distance is, you know, how far does it go before we start attenuating? Like I know, of course, in theory, light goes on infinitely. Like I've taken physics, but <laughs> you know, this is rendering. <laughs> so we gotta at some point say like, all right, uh, when should we stop drawing? And um, then we also, you can set a color temperature and then you have like a couple other settings like whether it should cast shadows uh, dynamically occlude. And then these spotlight and point light intensity scales um, are just kind of meant like there were, you can use both of these if you so choose, like if you wanted to have it like flare and do something else. Um, and that was just kind of like a, a little handle for that. But I generally don't use them. Um, I just kind of stick to these things. Um, but so on these components though, like, you know, they also have settings, right? But again, I probably wouldn't want to touch it here because then it's just going to do it on that one light. Uh, I would want to make sure I go back and do that, you know, on my class, right? So if I was actually going to, um, you know, make an adjustment to the dimmer and say like, okay, like I want this to, you know, cap at a lower value. I'd want to do it here. That way, it does it for every like light type. You know, uh, light that is deriving from this type. Um, same thing with you know. Let's just say, for example, um, like this frost one. Like, if I'm not going to use it, I can you know disable it, right? So that, that way, it's not uh, going to do any calculation with that if we don't need it. Um, but for the most part, you know, and then also we can add a component to it too, if we wanted to give it some extra functionality. So if, for example, this light had color mixing, um, I could add this color component to it because um, it comes only with the color wheel by default. Um, so if you kind of scroll down in here, there's a DMX section and it should have these um, options for you um, of the other things that you can add. I've noticed that, and I don't know um, if this is just because of the version that I'm running that Sometimes certain ones will actually pop up here in this custom section, like this Gobo spin. Like I know it's definitely a DMX component, but as soon as you add it, it seems to pop into it. So not exactly 100% sure what that is, but <laughs> if you are unsure, you can always search for it, right? We love search boxes. Um, that's kind of our jam, <laughs> I feel like. Um, all right, so we got this guy. He's, you know, he's addressed, he's ready to go. He's got some basic settings. 
Um, so now let's make them like do something. So what I actually use um, to control, I actually use this campus like Magic Queue. Since I don't have a lot of real estate, I'm going to do most of that work off screen. Um, but it's essentially just it's a free uh, well. This version is free. They also make consoles. And they also make other, you know, nicer things. But this is like when they give you a certain amount of like uh, universes that you can use for demo mode and for reviewing things. Um, so I had already kind of patched a show um, in advance. So, um, but in order to make this work, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go back and yeah, it's easier for me to match these honestly <laughs> to what I did on the on the campus. So uh, in that case, these actually were in universe two. And the Sharpie was actually the first one in the, oh, hold on, actually, these, all these were in universe two, right? And this is actually the first one. And where was my, my matrix? Was it 101? Which kind of makes sense. Okay. So, so I'm, in case you guys are wondering what I'm actually doing, I just wanted to make these numbers here match the ones uh, that I'm using. So I don't want to reprogram the, <laughs> the magic cube too. All right. So the lights only work either when you're in play or simulate or um, uh, obviously in standalone game. All right. So in this case, I'll just pop in the simulate so I can kind of still do some editor stuff as well. Um, and so then I can uh, start to play with this light. So again, for what do you, if I'll show it, but then I'll move it just because I don't have a lot of real estate. But I'm actually just kind of adjusting like what I'm doing uh, the same way that you would on any uh, any other console. So again, so you can kind of keep as much of this window as possible. So we can kind of see a few things about it, like what's happening um, here. So it is it does start, you know, it does kind of have like this nice little fall off. But if I were to adjust, you know, this distance, I can kind of cap how far it goes, um, if or increase it. Now, um, buyer beware! <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility, um, because the further out that it has to go, the more it keeps drawing. You know, these are, this is just general um, graphics like optimization things. But you can make these adjustments um, to them. So. And same thing if I, you know, right now the intensity is set to like 5,000, which is somewhat ridiculous. So if I was like, nah, it's really more like 2,000, um, you know, I can I can make those adjustments um, on it as well. So, but that's kind of like the basics of how you would just get this guy going. Um, and then again, because since it's got the color wheel, that's cool. Um, and then we also support gobos, which are like the beam shaping part, which is the really interesting stuff, I think, because this is kind of what makes this, um, uh, honestly, this new system, I feel like, looks so much nicer than the old one. The old one, if you were to look at it like dead on, you would never really get this effect, right? Because it's just like a double-sided mesh. It was not really possible to get this nice uh, kind of look of like looking down the barrel of a fixture. Um, so that's the main like change that I, I felt like was so obvious because like before if you were just sitting there and you know the light would kind of uh, tilt down and sweep across like camera like you just wouldn't really get this effect um, which is super nice um, but I mentioned kind of earlier that um, you know I like to have um, zoom on this fixture even though this fixture in real life doesn't however if you were going to um, you know, if it's just like a, a virtual show or something like that, you could definitely, um, you can definitely do it. So all I would really need to do is go in. And so on this fixture type right now, I have frost or focus hooked up to focus. Now we don't necessarily do anything with focus right now. So I'm just going to use that channel and remap it to zoom. <laughs> so all I'm doing now is I'm saying, hey, if I send focus on this thing, uh, don't send it to the focus attribute, send it to the zoom attribute. Um, so now when uh, when I you know pop in the simulate again and um, kind of do the same thing uh, where I'll dial this up. So now it's you, you can tell already it's using the parameter, right? <laughs> so the zoom settings here uh, start off fairly uh, ridiculous. Um, I can't remember what we got, where the values came from, um, but I'm going to adjust them down um, just in the interest of keeping it a little bit more 
um, sane. So you might notice that these numbers seem reversed. That is intentional um, because uh, typically on a console, when you first like like zero values are uh, lower and like, I guess the way Zoom is described, it's backwards of what you would think. So that's why they are backwards. You can put them the other way. It's not, it's not going to hurt anything, but it's just if you want it to match with a console right out of the box, it's probably better to uh, leave it that way. But you could remap it if you felt like it. So again, we'll pop back in the simulate. So that, all right, then now we have a little bit of a uh, normal thing going on. And, and now I can, again, adjust my focus. Uh, and it's going to adjust the Zoom here. Um, he also kind of did a pretty nice job of, like I said, so we actually took the, the publicly available like Gobo um, values so we can go through, you know, uh, you know, use these beam shaper things for it. Um, he also simulated what would happen if you do like a scroll. So like, you know, these things have the ability to do a, a, a Gobo scrolling, which is um, pretty cool that uh, it's supported. Yeah, because that's somewhat what it would look like if it was actually scrolling across the lens. Uh, and um, yeah, and then he also did like a little bit of a shake thing too. And like I said, he supports color wheel because this one is a color wheel function uh, type of light. And oh, and then he also did um, strobe, right? So like they ha you could always just turn it on and off like by yourself, but these actually have like a dedicated strobe. Um, channel so he kind of tried to emulate um yeah not actually looking at the real thing but just looking at the uh um documentation like what it should do um so so that's kind of like the the really down and dirty simple uh you know, like how to get this light um working so similarly with these um led pars since i had um, you know, they're already patched as well. Um, I can play with them. So let's turn those on. Do RGB dimmer. So uh, there we go. All right, cool. So same thing. Um, I'm just doing it on my console over here on the right. Um, but these are actually color mixing. So instead of using a color wheel, like I'm actually able to adjust, you know, exactly how much of each color I want to have in them. And then they also have an intensity, you know, master on them as well. So by default, these things also have, uh, you can see they have a zoom, they have a stroke on it. I'm not using them, um, but you could um, use them if you wanted to. Um, and then the last one is going to be this matrix. So the matrix is a little bit different in the fact that we we actually made a procedural uh, generating system for this because we kind of made we made the assumption at least in this case that it's usually going to be a grid, right? So it's either going to be you know, one by something or five by something or whatever it happens to be. Um, so by defining in here what fixture you know you're using, it has an inf the information about what um, how many um, cells are in it. So then on the base level, we can say, all right, what is the overall dimension of this light and width and height and depth? And we can say, generate a preview mesh. And so then it will generate this mesh of like what um, that fixture would look like. So it's a five by five, you know, with grid, you know, in it. Um, and if I change this, you know, and make it bigger, you know, that'll work as well. You know, you could also, like this 10 and you know make oddly shaped things like it just depends on you know obviously if you're going for realism you would get the real world measurements and do it um and then it's the same thing it's got intensity setting all these other things so it's patched um that one's good to go you pop in to simulate and um same thing where's my q picks uh i think it's this one yeah, there we go. Cool. And same thing. These are color mixing, so you can, you know, dial in as much or as little as you want. Or, you know, if I throw uh, a red flick on it and do include elements, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, so it's just, you know, again, you can, they show up as individual cells, so it's kind of, um, it's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> I, li I like I like these matrix style things. It's kind of a nice thing that we 
we didn't have in the in the previous version. Um, and it just wasn't really easy to do uh, before. So now we've made it pretty simple, I think, uh, in that aspect. So kind of talking about um, you know modifying these because again, if you're into doing previs, like you kind of you know you probably know a lot more about these lights than even I do. Um, so there's a lot of customization that you can do now that before was somewhat much more complicated. So now literally you can just come inside the class itself and define what you want the meshes to be. So if I was going to swap this out with something else, I could just change what the uh, base, the yoke and the head are. There's also a separate one for the lens. So you can use our lens if you want, or you could swap it out. Um, and like an example of that would be we kind of uh, came up with this other, you know, wash light fixture because, you know, they look, they have a different look. Like if you look at this, the front of it, you know, you'll see the individual LED, like rather than just like having like a lens on them, so to speak. Um, so this one just uses a different uh, lens in here um, type than uh, this one does. Um, but also you can also affect, um, you know, some other, uh, maybe more, more, you know, things uh, depending on what it is you're trying to do. So like on this matrix, for example, um, you know, not every light has this kind of octagonal type shape. Um, so I could actually swap that out if I wanted to as well. S since again, I'm just drug it right out of here. I probably don't want to do that because um, I'll modify it for the entire, you know, for the engine content for every other project that's referencing it. Um, so what I'll do again, I believe I already did made one of these. So I'll just um, drag it out of here. I've done it a bunch of different times. Uh, matrix one, sure. Um, so now I can edit this one. And uh, so this one uh, looks like a copy that I actually like kind of, oh, yeah. And so on this one, we have, uh, we actually, this is like an undefined one. Um, so you can see there's like nothing in any spots. So I'm not gonna use that one because I don't wanna recreate it from scratch. Uh, static matrix child, yeah, there we go. That one looks better. Okay, so we open that up. So you can see you have these different um, materials applied to it. So we have a lens material and a beam material. So if I go to this matrix lens material um, and open it up, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. So I put it in a cube view. So that's kind of what each cell is going to look like, more or less. But if I wanted to, I could pick a different type of lens. So we give you a few different options. So I'll uh, just throw like maybe like the circle one, right? Because yeah, you know, if you're using like a cupex or uh, something like that, it might look like that, or you know whatever. It's just uh, you can honestly pick. Let's see what else I have like that, or it could be something even crazier. You just put like a logo on it if you want. Um, I'll, I guess it defaults to circle, but uh, I kind of like the, um, um, I'm actually kind of a fan of the other one, the like kind of boxy or looking one. Yeah, this one, I kind of like this one. It's got like a thin little edge around it. Um, and yeah, it's gonna bug me about that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, right, because I actually modified. So again, I don't know if that was obvious, but that's what happens in this case where I'm trying to modify engine content <laughs> and it's it's being referenced somewhere else. So probably wouldn't uh, do that if if, uh, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you might want to actually um, you know, make sure that you leave these alone. And again, you make an immaterial instance um, in that case. So, all right, so that's kind of the basics. So getting these in, patching them, modifying some certain parameters of them. Um, so I'm just trying to think if there's anything specific about these. Oh, right, we talked about adding that color component. So if I had another fixture that did have that, um, for example, on it, um, what I would want to do is, um, again, on the class, like the copied class that I made, I would add that other component. So I would go and I'm looking for color. So I'm just going to add the color component to it. And then this will kind of give me this option for 
uh, adding a color mixing component to it. So if it has a color wheel, great, we could keep it. We could just disable it. It just kind of depends on, again, what the light can do. Um, and then we'd be able to link this red, green, blue to something in the patch. Um, something I know that's come up a few times is people have asked, like, well, some lights mix in cyan, magenta, and yellow. Like, But if I change these, it doesn't do anything. Um, and that's really because like this doesn't by itself do anything. <laughs> um, it's literally just a reference to like what's coming in here. So if I have a light that you know is coming in red, green, and blue, and I'm just sending it to cyan, magenta, and yellow, like there's no logic in here. These are just these are just names. Um, so you would actually have to modify the blueprint itself if you wanted to actually make this work. Um, because even though technically red is red and cyan are inverses of each other, it's not just the same as putting the value at its inverse because 100% red to zero would just be zero. Uh, so it's actually a different, you know, a different than that. Um, there's nothing that would prevent you from doing it. Uh, you just have to put that logic like into the blueprint. Um, so if you wanted to do that, um, if I look at the uh, We'll go to the actual light picture itself so you can kind of see what's inside of it. Um, the blueprint is very, very simple at this point, right? There's not a lot going on here. We initialize the fixture, we do occlusion if it's checked, and then literally we like update it. It's pretty much it. Um, so if you wanted to do uh, kind of an edit, this is the place you would do it at because this is where we're defining like, okay, what's coming in? And here's what's getting pushed to the fixture. So just as a kind of different uh, example. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this one rather than do a child so I can see still what's inside of it. Um, but this kind of, this value per attribute that's coming in is actually um, going to be different depending on what the fixture is. Um, but in, it's in this part here that we could actually um, determine like what we want to have happen. So if we knew for a fact that we were going to, um, you know, have um, some, you know, red coming in, and we wanted to change it to, um, you know, do some math and then pass it back to uh, to change it to invert it or something like that. Like this is the area that we would do it in. Um, so if anybody's trying to make Cyan, magenta, yellow happen. That's the spot you want to do it in. Um, and then I think, I think that's kind of it. I would definitely want to cover some of this pixel mapping stuff. So I'll, uh, I'd like to cover a couple other things, but I don't want to. We got miss time, that. Patrick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we're only an hour in. Would you like to I know. Uh, answer some of the questions in regards to these topics first? Yeah, yeah. I okay. What, I feel like I see a bunch of stuff over there so yeah was there anything that you saw that was kind of popping towards the top or something like that that maybe um or recent <laughs> yeah since we got some time we, cool. we can go through some of these and then we'll dive into the pixel mapping sure stuff um this was discussed in chat but um rob engel asked uh fix <laughs> hey rob how's it going man <laughs> i know yeah fixed, i know rob um parentheses fixed received dmx rate how does that relate to the actual rate packets are coming in from console. Don't you just ah. process packets as they come from the protocol? Interesting. So um, technically speaking, network timing is way faster than DMX would ever be, right? Um, and actually, technically, on network received uh, is faster than tick, even. Um, and so if we were to actually process that every time, um, we just be doing a lot of duplicitous processing work. So our guys came up with this nice system internally that rather than just doing it at the fastest rate possible, uh, DMX technically can't go any faster than 44 anyway. Um, so we can actually kind of set like a global speed limit as far as like, all right, how fast do we really need to update everything? And technically, if you're coming out of a grand MA, I think it's even only coming at 30. Um, but so what this that would actually do would be able to help have you be able to limit um, if you wanted to, even further, um, and try and match things. Um, but internally, um, what's actually happening is um, 
everything's kind of, if you're using, especially if you're using our fixtures, we use this on fixture patch receive. So what this actually does is it takes all the DMX that's coming into the buffer. Um, we'll actually check to see, okay, does the value that I'm updating match this particular patch that I'm going to try and update? And if not, ignore it. And it's really a speed um, thing um, in order to do that. It's actually pretty nice because in the past, um, there was another node that was, uh, um, shoot, I can't remember what it was called, on protocol received. Uh, you know, and I think we actually got rid of it. <laughs> oh, no. Nope, it's still there. On protocol received. And basically, that was always grabbing, like, the entire buffer, and then you'd have to, like, filter through it. And so this is already doing it, like, automatically. Um, so for us, like, yes, we receive it as fast as it can come in, but then we kind of chunk it down and say, okay, like, if it can only be sent at 44 hertz, like, you know, how quick do we actually need to update this? And so we kind of like push things together. So that way if you get 10 zeros in a row, we don't process 10 zeros. We only just, we kind of wait, buffer it, and then it's like, okay, this is the value that we're sending and then send it. Um, and since everything's working off interpolation anyway, it just, it works much, much better. So um, hopefully that answered that. <laughs> uh, Deadmau5 asked, Hope, hopefully mm. in future versions, we'll have the option to enable to dis enable or disable the spot slash point lights in the C++ fixtures without having, having to turn the intensity down to zero to save a wee bit of perf. Um, that actually, wait, say that again? <laughs> the last part? <laughs> um, yeah. Hopefully in the future versions, we'll have the option to enable to disable the spot slash point lights in the C++ fixtures without having to turn their intensity down to zero to save a wee bit of perf. So I guess the solution now is to turn the intensity ah, yeah, yeah. to zero, but if we can actually turn them yeah, off completely. Yeah, well, so I think what he's referring to is like, right, we have this um, thing in it now where this toggle light visibility, which essentially what it does is like, yeah, once the dimmer is actually all the way down to zero, it kills the light completely. And then like, yeah, you get back all that performance, right? And so this, this kind of brings up an interesting topic just in the fact of like you know why are these you know what what makes a light expensive to render and really like what it is you know because we're even though we have point lights and spotlights on them if it's not casting shadows and it's not doing occlusion it's not really that expensive <laughs> like at that point it's just like kind of it's gonna update like the part that it hits its color and that's not really that expensive of a process um, but for us the really expensive part is the the beam itself like you know and that's based off a number of samples and you know this complicated kind of math as to like what what goes into that and that's why we give you that that kind of control over this quality level but at the end of the day like all this stuff is just materials inside of unreal right so something that i kind of have been playing around with if you go uh if you actually want to dive into it and if you're kind of nerdy like me um you know there's this material instance for the beam and here is the uh the actual um, masters themselves are in here. So if you open up the beam master, um, you can actually see like what all it's doing to kind of create this uh, nice looking beam. And it's uh, uh, definitely more complicated than you know I would have been able to write. <laughs> but as far as materials go, it's not too bad, right? But what is actually determining this quality level is actually this node here and then i believe it's used one other time here right so this is actually the main one this one over here is just to um do some jittering to try and like hide i guess part of, or you know kind of do some of the blending to make it nice looking that one's not quite as re relevant but this one right here is the one that really determines like what is going on how many samples are we using to make this light look nice and so something i've actually done in, in a personal project is actually written some other code to modify this so because it doesn't like really you only need a lot of samples when the beam is extremely narrow or it's like got something in it so a quick just example on this because this is something that's kind of just new that i have kind of found out you know so if we zoom this beam you know way down um i mean probably even thinner than this like that's when the quality becomes like more obvious right so if i drop this down to low you can see it get kind of noisy and crunchy right like especially at the most narrow parts but when you're up you know higher further away from it or even better looking straight through it like it's not as obvious especially depending on what your intensities are and kind of what you're doing um so you can actually modulate that kind of you know 
differently maybe than we are uh, if you want to. And so I think if people are really looking to try and get um, some more perf out of it, like that's kind of where I would tackle it. Um, but as far as turning on and off components, like you can do it. Like, I mean, there's nothing necessarily that prevents you from, uh, like, cause like right now, like we're not even using the point light. I don't think um, you can just turn them off. Like I actually in mine to um, generally speaking, like, cause you'll notice like if, if these are facing, let me grab the actual light. Um, I did it again. <laughs> uh, if they're facing down, like, you know, if you have a lot of these, like this gets kind of obnoxious. <laughs> like there will there will be all over it. So actually in mine, like I actually just go in and turn off the spotlight component. Um that way when they're when I'm lining them up in the world, like I don't get like hundreds and hundreds of these like um oh I did the wrong one. Um you know, light balls on the ground because it will get you know all of a sudden your scene will be very very bright and it may just not be very easy to see what you're doing because like at runtime like of course it's you know if we do something we're going to turn it back on um but that way it's off when you're in the editor so cool another question maybe on any of this yeah stuff? for sure um a little bit on the same topic cm and cmndr music asked how many fixtures could reasonably be be driven by the engine on a single computer? Um, that really depends on the settings of the fixtures, but we've done some tests internally. Um, so especially if it's something like um, matrix fixtures or magic panels or something like that, where there's not a lot of beam. Um, I have another, here, let me say this. I have another level in here that I do my tests on. <laughs> Um, yeah, where, you know, this is what I'll do. So I have like 120 of them here. And this will actually run at 30 FPS at 1920 pretty pretty handily because um, it's all CPU. Now, um, something you will notice um, when you're doing this kind of stuff is uh, in editor, not so much, <laughs> right? Because we're drawing all the uh, widgets and stuff for the UI. Um, you'll notice a lot more. So again, this kind of gets... A little nerdy, but um, you'll notice a ton more game time when you are in uh, editor versus when you are in uh, like standalone. So if you're getting hit on your, your game time because you're just processing too much um, DMX stuff through through blueprints in the UI, uh, if you go into standalone, it'll be like almost negligible. Usually, where I find though is most people kind of get hit is on the GPU, and that is based off you know it depends on how many lights are in the scene, what the widths are, and how many time, you know, how much, uh, you know, overdraw you have. Because that's really just the main source of this is like, it's all translucency being added. But that's why I was saying like, if you're running into that, like dropping the quality level drops the number of samples. So it's being added less times. So if you go in and modify that material, like I, like I literally just, I did some tests on it and maybe I'll actually do a separate thing where I show how I did it. But I just clamp the range so that, okay, if if the beam is very narrow, make the quality high. If the beam is wide, make the quality low. And so that way, when they're overlapping and they're really wide, it's not that bad. It's almost indistinguishable. Um, and so it's kind of a nice way you can get some, some perk back there. So hopefully that <laughs> helped answer that. But it, it really just depends. I have the other demo level that, I guess I could show that one off. Why not? Um, that where the pictures actually came from, right? So I have a different um, magic cube file for that. So let me uh, just quickly save. I can also add, if you're looking at um, Patrick's statistics here for uh, performance, Discord does eat up about 20 to 30% of his um, GPU at the moment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors here. I run like dual monitors, I run, <laughs> I run everything you know, like terrible resolution. And there, as you can see, there's a bunch of junk open on the bottom that probably shouldn't. But um, but yeah, it, it really just depends. If you want to do proper like benchmarking on it, we recommend definitely run it in standalone uh, and pick the res you want. Try not to do DPI scaling and you'll, you'll get a much better, um, you know, kind of metric for trying to do stuff. All right, but if I go into this and I just play in the selective viewport, 
And let's see here. Oh, I think this one I turned everything on like ultra. But I mean, so you can see like our frame time is like decently, um, uh, decently high. You know, we're we're kind of hovering here a little bit. Um, but still, I mean, that's a decent amount of lights, <laughs> I would say. And um, it, again, a lot of it just depends on um, from there. You know, what are they doing? How much overlap is there? Stuff like that. So just by default, if I take these and you know start um, start zooming things out, uh, you'll definitely notice that time start to creep up, right? <laughs> like pretty pretty rapidly, uh, depending on how much they kind of are uh, overlapping. But in 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 a lot of cases, um, it's pretty good. There's I can't remember. Maybe about 200 lights or so in this scene. So again, like I said, like a slightly lower range. I'm doing 1920, 1080, and this is, uh, you know, windowed. But I mean, you know, it kind of just depends. We're still hovering above 30 with all this other GAC running. So it's pretty good, honestly. Um, but distances matter too, right? So all of these are probably set to, um, you know, a relatively modest. Like draw distance, probably like uh, I just had to guess. Yeah, fifteen hundred, right? So you know, if you put all these to ten thousand, then yeah, it's going to take a little. Um, so hopefully that helps. DJ Midnight asked, "Can you apply a custom gobo projection?" Yes. So that's a really good question. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> so uh, all of our lights. Oh. Side note, we also included some fun little like stage props. <laughs> I don't know if anybody noticed there in here. I know there seems to be some discussion on whether or not pipe and drape is actually a lighting thing, but we'll leave that alone. Um, but yeah, those these are also in here uh, as well. So some trusses, some corner blocks, and just some little pieces to make your stage look nice. But if you were going to add a custom gobo, so right now if you Look at the blueprint for the moving head and look at the gobo uh, component. You'll see what we have is actually to uh, a clean disk and a frosted disk. So this is kind of the way we deal with frost is uh, rather than using a blur function, which is super expensive, we just create a frosted version and a clean version. So if you look at it, what it actually is, is it's just a strip of all the gobo textures in a line. So that's how we can also do like the uh, um, kind of fade or slide between them, right? Um, so you can either create this on your own if you feel like it, or again, big ups to Francis. <laughs> he wrote this bake disk textures tool for you. So um, it's actually an editor utility widget. So if you run the widget, you'll get this nice little thing here. And so you have to make your effect table ahead of time, like what it's going to. Uh, and that you know, might be a longer topic than this, but if you look at the effect table, so um, that that is kind of provided. Um, this is kind of how we control all this. So we have this gobo table uh, and gobo wheel table. So if we open it up, like this kind of shows like what this thing is doing. But here are like the texture assets that we're using, and then you can use his uh, baker widget to bake out your own strip, <laughs> um, and it. There's one for colors as well. So same thing, like our colors are based off, you know, these color swatches, right? Um, and then we just bake them into a little strip, which would show up on this color wheel one. Um, same thing. So you could also um, do that as well if you have a known color wheel that you want to do. Um, one thing to keep, yeah, like you'll notice like on this one, the size of it is very small. Again, that's for performance. Uh, reasons, but on the Gobo, um, you might want to make it a little bigger just so you can get a little more resolution on what these things are when they're being projected onto the ground. Cool. And also, maybe just realize something else I didn't I didn't mention, but we also have sample assets for pyro, sample assets for lasers, fireworks, water fountain. Um, and if you want to see kind of just like a quick demo of all these in action, there's actually a DMX template project. So like when you first launch the engine and you can pick first person shooter and stuff like that in the game one inside the live events TV one, there's a DMX sample. And it's just, we um, 
the guy's recorded in some DMX and it just plays back in sequencer. That way you don't have to have a console hooked up or something like that to make it work. Um, That's cool. super cool. I didn't actually know that. Hmm. It's brand new. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would show it, except I don't really want to show my launcher. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I can do one more and then I can pop in the pixel map. Sounds good. Um, let's pick one last one then. Uh, Ritter has asked, when using ray tracing, the light beam goes through objects when using volumetric fog. Is there a way to fix this without being hacky? Probably not. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly, I don't really run ray tracing that much, um, but more than likely, the issue, like we're just drawing like a mesh, uh, sort of our, our ray march, I guess, like, but it, essentially, like it's gonna go through objects unless we like specifically do something to have it not do it but you know again if it's going straight down super simple but if it's like on an angle like and you're getting like a cut off on in, in an angle then probably not um but it's something you know you could definitely look at but similarly just if you turn on you know shadow casting and occlusion like it just depends on how many lights you have if you can get away with it i would say that plus ray tracing you're probably in for a bad time um but you know if you have a hundred of them right if you only have 10 sure maybe you could so. cool all right all let's right. uh yeah let's yeah, move yeah, on yeah. pixel mapping and then if we have more time in the end we'll get to some of the questions and yeah, yeah yeah so we can press on and that so yeah so the pixel mapping is super cool it's a, it's a new um feature that we kind of put in and really what i what i wanted to um kind of show off was just kind of just how how it works in general and then kind of maybe more virtual production use case because I think this is kind of where um, where I'm seeing a lot a lot of good use case for this so um, yeah this is kind of my my little test bed I was playing around with some like strip lights and this is the, the octa beam <laughs> um, and these are what the lasers uh, look like when they're just in level not doing anything um, but so for pixel mapping, again, all you need to do is create a pixel mapping uh, asset. So I will just make one from scratch again. Uh, we'll call this live stream pixel. And when you open up, you're going to get this new, um, there's some of these tabs up here, um, this new window that launches up. And again, if you are at all familiar with what pixel mapping is, like this stuff should look very familiar. <laughs> like, you know, a grid, kind of some stuff you can do. Um, but how you kind of interact with it, you know, varies from program to program. So the first thing that you'll kind of notice is we have, um, you know, some different options for what you can put on it. By default, we just um, start with a texture, um, but you can also use a material or a UMG widget now as you might imagine what in the world how would a material work <laughs> exactly the important part is they need to be in the ui domain so if you have don't know what that is um don't worry you're not necessarily alone <laughs> but um inside a material you will specify like what type of domain it is is it surface decal light function whatever we need to have it be UI. Why? Well, because materials, like by nature, don't necessarily have to be bound to two dimensions. <laughs> so this way, we're like, okay, we know it's going to be a certain size, and we can do this, you know some certain things with this. So they need to be user interface if you're going to use material. If you're going to use a texture, it's just going to take whatever the size of the texture is. Um, so I made this simple panner material. It's just like a noise with like some speed controls and some stuff that I could do. Um, and so if I put this guy in here, I'm I'm just gonna do it so we get a little bit of a little bit of movement. Um, um it's a little more interesting. So this actually has a size because again, materials by don't have a size. Like it's all just based on like whatever they're covering. Uh so you actually have to tell it like how many uh pixels like should it be um using. So then from there, we can kind of start defining like, what do we want to map? So the most simple one is a DMX screen. You drag this thing in um, and it has a little handle so you can kind of uh, throw around. It's just going to create a grid of, you know, uh, X by Y cells, right? And then just output that data uh, based on what I said. So if I pick here remote universe 30 and go back and open up a uh, so we'll 
pause that and I'll open up the uh, activity monitor. Um, and if I uh, once I hit play, I guess it'll probably populate. Actually, you know what? I'll use the other one. Okay, I know exactly what it is. And we'll set this to 30. Start running out of room. 1920 by 1080, <laughs> but all good. Um, so yeah, so if I hit, hit start um, and and kind of, um, I should be able to uh, get what what I want. You know, what what I'm going to send, I should be able to um, see it over here. Uh, but what I'm noticing is, uh, I don't think I have any controllers that are set up that high, so it might actually not work in this case. Um, but press on. So if I stick this show addresses, it'll show me what the address of each cell is. Uh, I could also have it show, you know, what universe it should be as well. Um, it is just kind of like, you know, whatever. You can size it to whatever size you want, and it's just going to spit out, like, whatever um, uh, whatever kind of happens to be in that cell. So it's not actually using anything with the patching system. It's not actually doing anything with that, it's literally just um, going to be sending like the raw values. So if you just had like a super simple like grid or something like this, this might be um, the way you want to do it. If you are going to be using fixtures, which is more than likely the case, um, you have a couple of other uh, options. I'll try and get the window bigger again. Um, so you can actually drag in a fixture group. And then define, OK, like what fixtures do I want to have inside of it? So if I pick that live stream one that I made earlier, I can grab these individual LED um, fixtures and put them in here and kind of arrange them, right? So I would say like this and uh, like this, right? So now I have you know these three fixtures, and they would pick, you know, they would do whatever color, you know, is kind of going across them. So you get a little visualization down here of whatever you have selected. Um, so I select the group, you can kind of see. So this is the value that would be going out um, based on this. So if I go back and I set my monitor back to 20, so that's where those are patched at. Um, I should get some, I'm getting my information out right now. Shouldn't need to have receive on, but I'm wondering if it's getting stomped on because I'm um, sending values from my magic queue. Oh, you know what? Aha! I, all right, all right. <laughs> I do think I know what's going on here. Um, but anyway, I'll come back to that <laughs> issue. But so this is kind of what you would do if you had them in a group, right? Um, so you're going to um, you can then just take the group itself and I'll um, drag it around, right? Uh, it doesn't actually like scale the things inside of it. It's just more a matter of like a handle, so I could do that. So I can put that guy up there. And then the other option we give you is for matrix fixtures. So if like we take that Cupix uh, five by five matrix example that I had, um, and then tell it, okay, we are this and the five by five, like then we'll get that layout too, and it'll tell you like which numbers they are. Um, so something kind of to note, like this is, um, this is this layout is based on what we set earlier in the patch. So if we go back to this asset where I defined this, this is what defines what it does. So if it instead we want to do, you know what? Actually, this one does one of these, right? If I save this and go back uh, and. Update it. I think I gotta like, huh? Um, I think I just have to like pick something up and pick it again. Uh, oh, it doesn't, it's not doing it. No, uh, that's kind of bug. Hmm. That should do it. That should change the sorting order of it. Sometimes it's useful to. Oh, you know what? It is. <laughs> I'm just stupid. It is five, six, seven. <laughs> it is doing it. Uh, so previously it would go one through five, and then six through ten this way. So it is. It's snaking back and forth. I just just like had a brain fart there for a second. So if I pop back over, yeah, okay, one through five, six through ten. All right, perfect. I was like, I know they made that work. <laughs> so so that's how you determine the sorting order. 
The only real difference on this one um, is when you bring it in, we don't know like what the matrix is going to be beforehand. So you do have to map these colors um, to tell it what it is. At some point, I think we'll probably um, figure out a, a better way to do that. But um, that's for now, you got to do that. So the these other things are, these extra channels are in case kind of what we talked about before, where um, you know, maybe there's a dimmer channel like in there that we're not using. Like, so we could add this extra cell attribute and say, okay, you know, uh, there is a dimmer in here. Um, and we just want to make sure it's always sending 255. But, you know, because when it's calculating this, like, I guess, step of output, like we're only using RGB, we can only sample RGB. We can't sample other colors. And this, this has come up a lot of times. Like, if I have a picture that's RGBA, why doesn't it use the A? Well, we don't know how much amber is required to make colors. So unless you have like a CIE chart and a super fancy uh, formula for us that matches that exact picture, like we can't know that because in computer graphics, everything's just RGB. We don't need ambers or whites or multiple blues to create colors. We only need three. Um, so you can do this stuff on your own, but however, like there is no magic formula to convert. RGB to RGB amber or RGB white, like it just doesn't exist. So you have to use a chart, and it mat and it would be something fairly complicated. Um, that being said, there are generic formulas, but guaranteed they won't work <laughs> for every case. So, but if you had RGB dimmer and you just wanted to send dimmer um, all the time, this is how you do it. If you had like per cell, there was an extra channel, and then if you um, had like a whole matrix fixture and you want to just make sure you're accounting for that in your channel step, you can do it here um, as well. Um, and then, so that's the main idea of like kind of how this works. Um, and then you can, um, like I said, this kind of controls whether you're you're sending or receiving um, DM, uh, DMX. So one thing that I want to do before I go too much further actually is I'm actually going to, kinda, I have a couple LED tube lights that I'm going to show like how, um, I would send DMX data to those. But in this case, since it's going through my router and it's not on the same local PC, I actually have to change my uh, plugin setting here to uh, use the actual Ethernet card rather than just like kind of loop back internal. I want to make sure it's using that and not sending out something else. Um, so that's something that has come up uh, in the past for me. It's like I, I want to. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm sending to these things. It's only just normally you probably wouldn't have your fixtures on Wi-Fi, <laughs> but because uh, COVID and demo, like this, we're gonna we're gonna do it. Um, so I, I'd set. So what I actually have here, a couple of these like uh, they're these are actually they're Voyagers. They're made by Digital Sputnik and they're like an, insanely bright for my camera. And it's a uh, it's like 83, I think, RGB um, nodes. And then it also has a temperature control. So it's got a fourth channel. Um, and we can actually use these like in combination with uh, pixel mapping to do some uh, interesting just kind of lighting and, and various effects. So in kind of prep for this, like I already made one. Um, so let me just make sure this is stopped. And uh, so this pixel mapping one should have these in here. So here, you know, was just some like tests and stuff that I was doing earlier with um with a different setup. But these are these two. So I have two of these Voyagers, right? And so it's an 83 pixel thing, and it just makes a little strip like this. Um, and that's actually what I'm going to use. So um, once I hit play, like you can already kind of see it working sort of so obviously exposure settings like wow patrick that doesn't look like it's doing anything that doesn't look anything like it right so important things to note camera exposure still matters um but you can imagine like something like this for uh virtual production right where you would have maybe several of these in front of your talent or kind of near them and you can get this nice little scrolling effect as if like oh they're walking through a forest or whatever it happens to be. Now, a lot of times, like in entertainment, we just use these for effects, but especially in, in uh, things like film and, and, and things like that, like this is extremely powerful because LED walls are extremely expensive. This thing is like $500. So I could buy a ton of these, get some nice you know glow and stuff from the front, and not have to build maybe that front R 
whatever, or, you know, and you can use any different type of light for this kind of thing. Um, but on the set, on the note of that exposure thing, we give you a master brightness control. So I can actually dim this sucker way down. And so then, you know, you might actually be able to see like a little more of like the, the finer like nuances like in the color, uh, depending on, you know, what's going on. Um, if you're seeing like some sort of like skipping or lagging, it's from sending ArtNet over Wi-Fi. I don't recommend that. Um, but it's a it's a pretty cool um, like effect that we can do with this. Uh, and uh, the guys at like I said at Digital Sputnik were super nice to be able to send us a couple of these and um, and play around with them. So um, so what I'll do I'll just kind of just for sake of example, we can go back to the logo, right? And then you can kind of see like the clearly defined like black regions, right? In here that you would get, um, you know, from this being uh, on here, right? So depending on where I move it, you know, I'm gonna get different, you know, levels of what's happening. Um, so, okay, that's super cool. Like I, I love it. What else can I do with this? Um, so it, knowing that uh, you know this can be um, you know either a, t a texture, um, why couldn't we use a scene capture, right? So that's kind of what um, I would anticipate. You know, most people are thinking if they're thinking virtual production. So if you notice the uh, editor chugging, you are not that your eyes are not deceiving you. Having the pixel mapper open is quite heavy on the editor. <laughs> now, if you're running it. Uh, and, and standalone or doing something like that, um, it's fine. It's literally just because it's drawing real. So just a, a, a note on that. If you're going to run this in virtual production and you intend to run this on an editor machine or something like that, um, uh, like while you're doing other things, like be wary. Maybe put it in multi-user, maybe put it on another machine. Because if you, if you leave this window open and um, it's doing this and you're playing and you will you will notice a considerable hit. So just as a side note, um, but for the sake of you know, kind of what we're doing. So all I did is I I'm using a regular scene capture. Let me get some water. Yeah. Mm. Regular scene capture 2D. Uh, I set up a render target and uh, picked. Uh, I think I just use the default settings. So now wherever I move this thing, right, it's going to draw to this texture. Um, so if I go back into my pixel mapper and grab that texture, uh, which hopefully should be named RT underscore something, right? Perfect. Um, so now I have this texture of that render target coming in. So I could, you know, scale these lights appropriately um, and put them in the scene. And sure, let's do something like that. And I'm gonna hit play. So now, um, you know, I should get some some light color that's gonna match the scene uh, coming from these. So uh, one important thing to note about this is what you're doing as far as color temperature, color space, everything color matters. <laughs> so before you get like too crazy with just throwing things in here and putting colors on them. It's super important to know like what color temperature you're using um, and do some little basic calibration stuff. Um, because, uh, you know, especially when you're working in, in film and television, like that stuff, if you're gonna try and use it to light talent, is gonna matter a lot more than if you're just like aiming lights in the camera for, for like a show. So for example, like, you know, I don't know, it's kind of tough to see again, like this comes out fairly white looking. And at first I was thinking there's actually like a problem. Like I was like, huh, I wonder if our algorithm's bad. Um, but what I actually didn't know right away is that these lights actually don't use a dimmer. <laughs> like this isn't a dimmer channel at all. It's actually a color temperature. So if I set this to zero, you can see how amber it gets. It's adjusting the color temperature based on a scale from 2600, I think, all the way up to 56K. So I put this at 255, um, it's gonna be at 56K. So it's literally sampling the exact same thing, uh, but internally the light has a mechanism to determine color temperature. Uh, so this is pretty critical to, to kind of just note if you're doing this kind of stuff like so if you're using like really nice lights like these or re lights or uh 
sky panels and things like this, like they'll have calibrated, you know, calibrated color modes. And so like you don't have to think about this much stuff. You say, hey, you asked the DP, like what what temp are we at? Okay, you set it and then then you go and everything should match. Um, because you know, as I was talking to you about earlier, like, you know, I literally thought there was a problem, but then I kind of had to like look at my little my little chart here and I was like, no, if you're 2600, like that's pretty amber, like that's actually pretty correct. Um, and so, you know, I just use that as like a like a little reference check in my head. It's like, okay, here's what, that's what's happening. Um, but if you you know if you ever want to do a sanity check, you can just throw up color bars or something like that and kind of make sure, okay, this looks right on camera for what I'm doing. Um, and um, but other than that, it's pretty cool. So the 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 cool thing about this though, like as I said, is like, all right, so it's just using that scene capture. So if I were to go and um, go to my HDRI backdrop and you know swap this out for something that's you know a little more colorful uh you know boom we get the same effect from the light as well because all it's doing is it's just going to render that scene capture here and now we get this thing um so you can't see my one on the ground but it's a little it's a little green looking um it's because I, I got two of them that um you know that i have in here so super super powerful stuff um you know and actually yeah, i'm moving the other one uh maybe this one Right. So like depending on where it gets, like, you know, it's gonna start to dim down considerably to kind of match, you know, what it's seeing what is happening inside the scene. Right. Um, so really, really fun stuff. Um, and and this is definitely something I think I've I, you know, a lot of people have seen in other demos and stuff like that where people have written this custom logic and now we um provide that just as an engine feature. Um but um yeah, so just I was thinking about that. Well, can I use this for other things too? You know, does it have to just be these things? And um, of course, the answer is yeah, sure. Why not? So you could, you know, in the case of like this, for example, like this doesn't necessarily have to just drive colors. Like we're using colors, but it could be, you know, anything. Right? It could be motor winches. It could be um you know could other be actually like gameplay elements right and so like i was kind of like just toying around with it in another project but you know i can take this and read it back and use it to drive something uh cat ragdolls exactly <laughs> something like that um i just saw that pop up so that's very funny um yeah like why not you know because at, at the end of the day it's just it's just values right so if i you know look at it like right now um, I'm not playing anything, so there's nothing coming in. Um, but if I do this, and actually 20 is the other one, right? Got to be on the right mapping. Um, there we go. We'll play this. And so like now, so I'm getting all these values like coming in, right? And so, yeah, I could use this to drive, you know, whatever I wanted to. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty fun stuff uh, to play around with. I'm, I'm really excited about kind of what, um, what they've been able to come up with uh, for this, and there'll definitely be some more improvements. Like you know, we 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 do our best to kind of like make this UI like you know feel uh, nice and responsive and stuff. But there there's definitely like a few changes that I think we're gonna we're gonna make going forward. Um, but I think pixel mapping is still technically beta. I want to say <laughs> um, so. I can't, you know, I, I haven't had any major problems with it, but at the same time, like you may encounter some bugs. I do know of one for sure. Um, so if you start dragging in this box, you'll notice the range seems way out of whack <laughs> there. Uh, it is not correctly like normalized. So just know that it should be based on whatever your max value is for DMX, <laughs> right? So. That is one that I know about, but other than that, we've had a, it's been pretty nice. And you can again, you can set up multiple mappings. You can use uh, you know different you know fixture setups and configs. And there's a bunch of um, a bunch of blueprint nodes to control all this stuff as well if you want to. Um, cool. So how much time do we have left? <laughs> We got some time. I do have a couple of questions yeah. I'd like to go through, yeah. but if you cool. if if you're good to stay on for another, I don't know, yeah. half hour or so. Yeah, yeah, sure, cool. absolutely. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I kind of want to get as much of this out as possible. Yeah, let's do like, it. We're here. We're live. A, I get a knowledge dump. You know, it's like all right, like. Uh, 
in the wild and see see some people do some yeah. stuff. So, did you have anything um, left that you wanted to go through before we dive into the questions? You know, um, maybe just one other little thing because I, I made a video a while back about how to control like other objects like with DMX and that has changed somewhat um, in this version and it, it's actually become much much easier um, to do uh, so like just for the sake of it I'll just create like a, just a regular like um, so I'll just call this DMX let's see uh, I before E right <laughs> It still looks wrong. I don't know. Um, so all we need in order to, you know, look for a patch is a DMX component um, on it. But inside the graph, like like I said before, we kind of had this like on protocol received, and there was all this kind of stuff on that you had to do. We've actually made it so much easier um, to to just like receive information. So uh, in the same. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to use the same node that we use uh, inside the fixture as well. So I'm going to add a uh, on uh, fixture patch receive event. Um, so what this is going to do is say, okay, like if the patch that we're looking for, like if this matches, like we're going to do some logic with it. Um, and this is like has made everything like so so much easier <laughs> i feel like to, to work with than the old way of doing things because now we don't have to worry about filtering and like these other kinds of um these other kinds of things so if uh for example like we all oh, something that kind of has come up a, a decent amount of times is like all right we want to um you know whatever we, we want to um uh, I don't know. I guess it depends. Like control something else with like RGB, right? So if I if I just like grab like we'll just grab like simple uh, LED par, right? And so now I have um, a patch that is associated with this. Um, now I can actually kind of do this nice like um, uh, you know attribute map, and I can just do like a find. and I can say, hey, with the red, I want you to do some kind of logic here. Um, and it's going to be based off whatever you know the red channel is from here, and it's just so much easier than the other way <laughs> of doing it. In my other video, I felt like it was so complicated, like to to do this kind of stuff. But now we're just going to get like a float value out for whatever red is like for this particular patch. And so that's how like in the Octabeam like thing here, like so if I um, I got to load up another show file, but so, somebody had asked me before, like. How are you actually controlling it? Because I, I did do um, like a little video where I was like, you know, I want to have it fly up and down, right? And I was like, I want to control this you now with DMX. Um, so like on my little magic queue here, like I had some position, like some default things that I was doing with it. Um, but like, I you know, I wanted to be able to control like how does it go up and down and do this kind of stuff, right? So in, in order to do that, I had to kind of just, be a little clever like all right you know i want to use uh just something simple that i know so like red, red green and blue was kind of like what i came up with for that um and um inside this uh control blueprint like uh i basically i use the same thing right so i'm using this on patch receive um i'm getting the values and then i'm using red green and blue to do something else right so i use that to set my location, right? So here I'm just remapping the range because position could be anything. So I just wanted to match it to, uh, you know, something that could be useful. Um, but this is exactly how I did it, you know, for the same thing. Like, so it's it, honestly like it, it's so nice because like before, yeah, you definitely had to do um, a lot more stuff with like this. And uh, I don't know, it, it was just kind of a mess. This just made it so much easier. Big, big thanks to the guys for actually doing that um, for us. So if I turn on this receive again, um, in theory, I should be able to affect this guy. Uh, you know what? I'm a liar again. I got to do this <laughs> so I can send things internally again. I was like, huh, it doesn't seem like it's doing anything. Right, so I have this default position for like this guy. But if I wanted to like move it, you know, all, all I really did um, Let's just make like a red, green, and a blue um, for this guy. So then I could just like <laughs> adjust where I wanted it to be in space. So I used 16-bit values so I could get a little more 
pieces out of it. Um, but you know, that, that was kind of the idea. Like, and then I, I made another thing so I could turn the top on it. And then most of the other things that I did, you know, are, are, are just like using the existing things that were in, that we ship now. So we have like the, uh, the, we have the wash beam lights. So if I grab the, uh, I think I used XB as the thing for this, so I could do the, you know, and just whatever. So those were that, you know, and, and it was just, I don't know, it was a lot of fun to do. It kind of gave me like a little bit of just fun to be able to like try and create something different that wasn't your normal uh, fixture with it. But, and then, you know, same thing. I just like, I mapped that to like, just like a dimmer channel. So I could, you know, that's actually the uh, pyro asset that we ship um, with it. So um, I had a lot of fun with it. And then the, let's see the laser. Uh, again, I think I just mapped it to a color. I did the exact same thing. So like, it's just like, um, oh, actually that's that laser, I guess. Um, but yeah, so if you're trying to use blueprints to do um, other things, like this is now like the preferred easy method of doing it. So cool. Now I can take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got plenty so if we are oh. not able to tackle some of them uh, i'll make sure to send them all to patrick and if any of them were valuable we will go ahead and answer them on the forum announcement post uh, that you can find right. on forums.unlengine.com uh, go to events and uh, that's where you find all of the announcements for our live streams um, cool. let's see here so green toppings asked so when does an equivalent osc subsystem come out haha <laughs> that's an excellent topic <laughs> so um in the future, that is on the roadmap. Um, so where this is actually going to apply, and I don't want to get derail too much from DMX on this one, but since it is still in this live events control area, um, inside of um, 426, you have this option now. Um, if you go into your plugins and do remote remote control API, and this is kind of what I was talking about you about yesterday, and so I won't. I won't um, and then this remote control web interface is something that will come to the marketplace. Like, I might actually be out, um, but if not, really, really soon. So this, um, what this gives you is this miscellaneous remote control preset. And so if I do remote control preset, uh, one, two, three, whatever it is, uh, inside here, if I open one of these up, you'll kind of notice on the right-hand side, I get the option to expose properties or any object inside of Unreal. So let's just say it was the, I could expose its rotation, location, and, you know, whatever, visibility. And so you'll get, you get this kind of nice little, like, um, grouping of um, those properties. Then if I come out of edit, you know, you lose the eyeballs. But so then I can actually just use this as like a nice little hot control <laughs> spot, which is kind of handy and just by itself. Um, but you can actually, this is actually becomes exposed to a web server as well. So inside my output log, it's probably bugging me about it somewhere in here, <laughs> but it's doing it. But this is also going to be the route in for OSC, uh, hopefully MIDI and Artnet uh, DMX will also. So you'll be able to just quickly say, okay, I want to bind this position to this channel in Artnet or this channel in MIDI or this uh, float in osc so that is something that is kind of on, it is on our roadmap and on our radar um i don't i can't give exact times or dates or anything but it's coming <laughs> all right um andy films one asked when we get to pixel mapping can you ask if we can attach a live link controller to the light to control its position in real time via something like an optitrack system Ah, interesting. So I guess the I'm gonna I'm a little bit confused about the pixel mapping part of that because like pixel mapping you you kinda have the light based on like a location in the environment. So if you were to move like the scene capture, like I guess that would kind of pick up what's happening based on your movement. Um but it might be something that you have to I think you'd have to think about that a little bit, how, what you actually want to have happen in that case. Um, but there's no reason that you couldn't do something like that. <laughs> so now I was just thinking in my head, I'm like, because 
if I just moved it slightly, like, would I even be able to tell the difference? Like, probably not, you know, if it's like an environment, right? Um, but, you know, since it's capturing anything that's in the environment, like, what, what would happen, though, is if, you know, you had, say, like, a, you know, <laughs> whatever, hopefully not a cube, but something more interesting that, you know, went in front of the camera and went, uh, you know, across the viewport, like, you would see that, <laughs> right? And that would affect the lights, you know, that are mapped to that area. Like, in theory, I don't think you would move the lights around positionally. You know, you would kind of just, you know, have them set up how they would be in my head. Rob Engel has another question. It feels like the DMX yep. library includes both fixture definitions and patches. Can these concepts be separated or shared since we might want to reuse the fixture definitions a lot, but a patch is really per show? Yes. So, Rob, you're going to really like this. <laughs> so, um, literally, if I just create like a new blank DMX library, you know what? Whatever. <laughs> um, and it's like completely blank here. I can actually just go in here and control C, control V, <laughs> like from one to another. Uh, you can do it from different projects, <laughs> and I've actually done it between different versions. Uh, and so, yes, so you can kind of keep these fixture definitions like and drag them in, from, copy and paste from other projects if you want. Um, we don't have our own system of specifying it though because we kind of were hoping people would lean on gdtfs honestly if they want to use real world fixtures um so you probably just you know you create a gdtf um for it and there you go but yeah copy and paste for the win is exactly right i was like i had no idea if that would actually work initially and it works in the same project and literally if i open up another instance of unreal i can just copy and paste into that one too so it works pretty good the amount of times I come across that the solution is Control C plus Control V I, has been no, <laughs> surprising. I was I had my doubts because like you know I did make like uh, you know in 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 one case like um, I may uh, I just delete that guy so I don't uh, like with the magic panel like that was a fairly comp you know annoying one to do the first time I was like gosh I don't want to do it again and so I just literally went and grabbed it and copied it and pasted it in another product. I was like oh that works great. all right great perfect done <laughs> so cool let's see um final pixels asked is dmx fully compatible with end display quadra sync cards etc we're getting tearing and random stutter and lag so i would be willing to say that that has little to do with dmx and is likely to do with the lights themselves um because like the actual dmx like you know it it kind of depends, like, we're not synchronizing it over live link right now. So if you were, if it was receiving on each individual um, machine, you know, that would just be up to how accurate is the timing between them. So I will say this, um, I don't know how accurate that actually is. We've all seen it where you, especially if you have RNF fixtures and things like that, like there's delay, like they're not necessarily 100% in time. Uh, and if we're only updating ArtNet at 44 hertz and your stuff's gen locked at 60, I can definitely see there being some room for error in there. Um, but more than likely, like it's not so much that the DMX is being received at different times, it's how the beam is actually being drawn across them um, that may not be synchronous. Um, so that would kind of take a little bit of troubleshooting to find out you know, where that uh, thing lies. But as of right now, like we don't push DMX over live links, so there wouldn't necessarily be um, a mechanism for that. However, I, I would, what I would probably do if I knew I was doing an end display project is like I probably would send DMX to the master and then use internal protocols like cluster events or something else to push the updates to the nodes. That way, I can make sure. Okay, that part I know for sure is synchronous. Um, rather than sending DMX individually to separate nodes, like I think that, you know, it's probably not going to work as well. So, just a side bar. <laughs> Earlier during cool. the stream, um, Epic Optimist asked: In the DMX template, the lights mm -hmm. utilize a level sequence to animate. Is it better mm -hmm. to program the animations in .2 or another LD program, or use the level sequences? 
Oh, cool. So that actually, I totally forgot about this part of it. You can record DMX into level sequences. So that's actually what we did. Um, so I'll run through that expeditiously quickly. <laughs> All right. So if you create a new, actually, I don't even need to create a level sequence. Uh, use Take Recorder. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with Take Recorder, um, you know, actually, I guess that probably gave me, let me remove this monitor here. Um, so now we have the ability to record in. There's a separate type of DMX track, right? So if you go to add track and you have the DMX uh, plugin enabled, you'll see this DMX library track as an option. Um, so, but you don't actually even have to set anything up here ahead of time. If you just open up tape record, take recorder, which again is like a plugin, I don't believe is enabled by default. Um, so take recorder, you just turn that guy on, um, and. Then you'll add your source. So I'll say, all right, I'm going to add a DMX uh, library. Pick which one. So uh, this case, I think I'm, I don't even know what I'm using anymore. Uh, I've got too many of them. Live stream is on the other level. I had the Octobeam working, so let's just go with that. Um, so then from here, you can define what um, patches you want to record. So you can either add them manually, which Sounds like a big headache to me. Um, uh oh, oh, I don't think it like that. Mm. Here we go. Hey, okay. Nice. <laughs> I, was like, I didn't like my clicking. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a pain. Or you can do this: add all fixture patches. Click that; it's going to add every patch that you have in that library as an option of something to be recorded. Um, you can tell it to record into subscenes, but I think that part actually doesn't work um, properly for DMX. It does work for other things, but not for DMX. Um, and so then, okay, cool. We're like ready to go. So I can actually so you set you know your rate and stuff if you want to. So let's do this. Uh, it's enabled. Got it. Okay. So we'll pop into simulate so we can see hopefully that it's doing something. Um, oop, yep, okay, all right, and then I'll hit record. So it's going to go three, two, one. All right, so now we're plotting keyframes. So if I uh, do this, and so now it's going to start plotting keyframes only for the things I change, right? So once it stops, so you can see it, it stops recording because I haven't made a change in value. So then if I tell it to bounce, like then it's going to just start recording tons and tons of keyframes. And right now I'm just triggering sequences I've already programmed, right? So cool. All right. So let's just say that that was, that was good. So we'll stop. Um, now we want to go back and review this uh, recording. This part um, burns me almost every time that I remembered. So right now, if I were to just go back and review this and I hit play, I'm going to get some weird results. The reason is I'm still listening to DMX coming in as well. So I need to pause my receive. Um, and then I can kind of come in here. And again, if I pop back into simulate and I hit play and play this back, um, I should get back exactly what I recorded. So there's where I snapped it down. And there's where this is going. And then I like stopped and was yakking about something. And then it um, turn on the bounce and you know, whatever. And so this is super, super cool because then you could have somebody who, you know, record a show and you don't have to, you know, be there for it, right? Um, so there, uh, when you tick it down, you can kind of see where all the keyframes are, um, you know, and kind of what's going on. And um, it's pretty performant. Flow, the master from Geodesic, uh, wrote some pretty awesome optimizations for this. So it's actually extremely efficient playing back because, as you can imagine, if you have hundreds of lights, and each one of these has dozens of parameters inside of it. It can get pretty unwieldy really fast. Um, but he did, he did a pretty awesome job um, optimizing it. So yeah, that's uh, that's how the CMX sample was made, though. So they actually ended up recording it in uh, from uh, like a console. And then it just plays back. That way you didn't have to have a console to use the sample. That's awesome. And you can also edit them afterwards. Yes. You can. So by default, when you obviously, like, if you've used Take Recorder before, you'll know, like, they're locked by default. So it may seem like you can't do anything. Um, that's just because the sequences are locked. Um, but then from there, yes, you could actually just move keyframes around and everything uh, should be good to go. Uh, let me just see something. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, so in 
I'm using like slightly ahead um, version of this. So like I build from source code. If you're using the launcher version, um, it may be slightly different behavior in here, but it's pretty much the same thing. But if you build from source, it'll look identical to this. It's just, I, I can't remember if the, I think it nested in a sub scene in the main version, but now we've kind of taken that out. But cool. Anything Sweet. else? Yeah, yeah, we got a few more. You got time? <laughs> yeah, 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 cool. totally. Let's keep yeah. going. Mm -hmm. uh, Benevolent Dreams asked, earlier you guys were going over the timing data. The audio guys are working on the quartz timing stuff. Is there a way to tie the two together to get lights to do things on beats? I don't see why not. I mean, I don't, I don't specifically know, I guess, what he's referring to, which maybe that's just my ignorance. Um, but since, again, since they're all blueprints, like, you know, using kind of like the logic that I use for this to, uh, as an example, um, you know, yeah, there's no reason that you couldn't, you know, write something so that, okay, if this is happening, like, do this thing, <laughs> you know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hopefully that hopefully that answers that a little bit. <laughs> it might be a little vague, but um, it, uh, I don't know of exactly like what the hooks are for that course I'll, system. <laughs> I'll ping the audio guys and see if we can. Yeah, get, yeah. Say, now I'm, now you got me curious. <laughs> like, what is this doing? Well, because I know like uh, our our, our um, there's some audio reactive blueprints floating around on the internet, and uh, I've definitely used those to hook them up to lights. <laughs> so yeah, you can definitely do it that way. I'm writing a note about it right now. Cool. Let's see. Um, uh, PLNRD asked, do you support black lights or just LED lights? Um, I'm a little confused by that question. Like, um, does it say input or output or? That was the question. OK. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, not really. Well, if that was on pixel mapping or what that was for, so it was at the end of the stream, so I, I would think so. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I I mean, I think uh, get black light. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> Let's see, we got a few more. The answer is always yes. It just depends <laughs> on how much work you want to it, do. <laughs> right. When the engines, <laughs> when you have the yeah. source code. Yeah, yeah. It, your oyster. I hate to say it that way, yeah. but yeah, that's kind of how it is. It's like, well, you can kind of do whatever you want. You could technically write another version of Unreal inside of Unreal if you really wanted to, <laughs> but I don't know. So. Dokken Za asked, can you show us how you made the strip lights on your sandbox map? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally, sure. Um, so all I did in this case was um, I created a patch for um, the, the strip light. So I'll just show you what it looks like. So it's all just based on um, what you define inside here. So in the LED strip, I just told it that it's five by one um, instead of being like five by five or something like that. And then when you take the uh, you know the uh, static matrix uh, light out of here, um, once you tell it what it is and then give it some uh, dimensions, then you can uh, generate the mesh, right? So I just told it that it's 300 by 20, right? But if I, you know, if I made it 20 by 20, you know, it's going to, you know, be this nice small little, all right. And if you don't like those things, <laughs> well, a couple ways to fix it. I'm just pop into game mode. Um, but so then you have like, see how they're like really skinny now? But yeah, so if I just grab that thing again and put it back to 300, um, and regenerate the mesh, then we got that again. So that's all it is. Uh, if you, you just gotta kind of, I guess, be cognizant of, you know, is it this way or, or this way? <laughs> Cause it may affect like what you, what you did in the patch, right? Like if you told it, okay, it's an X, you know, it's one by, or, um, it's one X and by Y, you may want to have, you know, have it go a different direction. That's how you do it. And they're pretty cool. Like actually, they're pretty nice looking. Grid twenty one asked, "Can you override a lighting program if you wanted to freestyle your DMX for an extra touch?" Um, yeah. I mean, well, because obviously, like you have this override of your um, um, send and receive, so you could just literally like 
stop receiving if you wanted to do something on top of it. I was like, or I mean, I guess the other possibility would be, let me see here, um, would just be like if uh, you can always write some logic as well to kind of sit on top of it. If um, you know, you because you, you, we have all kinds of uh, <laughs> blueprint nodes for for like everything you would ever want. DMX for the most part, so you could definitely like read the incoming signal and modify it in some fashion. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> then Drolis asked earlier, do the fixtures actually cast lights on other actors, and can it render without volumetrics, like an FOH system? Uh, you definitely could turn off the beams if you wanted to. Yeah. Um. So. The main reason that we have the beam shader is just because, like, internally, if you weren't using the beam shader um, and you're using just like um, like a default light, right? Um, let me go back to my ambient, yeah, my dark one. So if you just pull in like um, a spotlight, for example, and we kind of um, I don't know. Well, anyway, I can just describe what I'm talking about. But like, the beam itself coming out of a spotlight, like it is ba it, it what determines like what it looks like is actually like the fog, right? It has nothing to do necessarily with um, the light part itself. Like, so you have to play with like grid pixel size and deal with atmospheric height, you know, height fog and this kind of stuff. Um, but like, what we noticed was just you know, since that's what's driving it, there was no way to actually shape that. <laughs> currently like light functions don't affect fog it only affects like what it hits so that's why we have it um but if you don't want the beam to be shown and you just want to have it like just cast light um absolutely you can just go into the um the print and just literally remove the beam instance material and uh or just modify the shader um to not draw that so like actually like in, in my not here, but in some of the other setups, like I've actually gone in and modified the master material. Um, let me see where light fixture materials master be master, right? Um, so I mean, essentially, it's just going into this emissive, right? So I literally just put in like uh, an inhibitive, right? Inhibit. And if I multiply here and draw this guy in here and go like that, right? So now I have like a master inhibitor. <laughs> so essentially I just cut off the beam, right? Or I could put it to something very small so that it would not, you know, draw as much beam and you get more stuff on the floor. Like that's totally valid as well. I'm gonna put it back though. <laughs> See, I think. I think that was the last question and we are almost oh, out of time here good well that's really good <laughs> there were some other uh, i know y'all asked some other questions if it's not related to the topic or sort of uh, pa patrick's expertise then they unfortunately aren't uh, they don't get asked on the stream so we get all okay. the questions yeah um but unless cool. unless i know patrick is potentially able to answer them then just receiving a sorry i don't know it's not too interesting that was great <laughs> yeah Patrick. There's probably a lot of us because <laughs> nobody, nobody knows everything. Unreal right, Engine so. Five, it's it's coming. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's tough. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, so it's cool. happened. I know everyone's excited. Patrick, thank you so yeah. much for coming on stream today. Chat, please give it up for Patrick. Um, spending a, quite a bit of extra time here as well, just answering all your, uh, most of your questions. Super exciting. If you joined us from the start today, thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the stream. Make sure you give us some feedback in the survey that will go ahead and drop the link in chat for y'all. Uh, let us know what you'd like to see in the future, what kind of topics, um, as well as features and things that you'd like us to cover. Also how we did, what we could do better, etc. Just go ahead and sp speak your, you know, 
speak your truth right in there. Um, cool. If you are new to the Unreal Engine community, make sure that you visit uh, unrealengine.com. You can download the engine for free. Uh, install, it's right in the Epic Games launcher if you already have that, and you can get started immediately. I do want to make a shout out to Unreal Online Learning. Uh, we have about 160 hours of content right now where you can uh, follow along from getting started into more in-depth co in depth courses um, into some of the features and uh, topics, um, general game development top topics, but um, of course, specific to Unreal. Um, if you are a member of a community and you're producing content already, make sure you let us know what you do. Uh, if you've seen this from the beginning, we do air the new spotlight as part of our uh, live streams. It also goes up on YouTube. Um, and we pick community uh, spotlights from the community. And so if you go ahead and submit projects, whether it's on the forums, uh, we check Twitter, Unreal Slackers, which is, by the way, our unofficial Discord community. Uh, great place to learn, share, and discuss everything Unreal. Uh, we're also looking for new countdown videos. They are 30 minutes of development captured from the editor. Um, speed that up to five minutes and send that to us separate together with a uh, image of your logo. And then we'll go ahead and composite that together um, with the little countdown. It's cool. It's a good way to get some um, attention for your project repeatedly on the stream. Um, if you stream on Twitch like we do, make sure you use the Unreal Engine tag as well as the game development category. That's the best way for us to find you as well as other people interested in watching you uh, stream and work with Unreal Engine. It's quite cool. We're going to go ahead and make sure we raid someone um, after the stream here as well. Uh, make sure you follow us on social media. And if you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit that notification bell so that you get all of our updates and everything else that we release there. We do have a lot of things that don't go up on Unreal Engine Learn Learning, such as these uh, live streams, our webinars, um, all of our content from our events, um, like Unreal Build Virtual Production. We also have 50 videos from uh, Unreal Fest online that we did earlier this year. There are loads and loads of content over there. Um, next week, we are doing the year in review stream with Tim Sweeney. And so if you're excited to come and join us for a little bit of a recap of the year, um, we're also going to have Brian Karras as well as Grayson Edge um, and a little bit of a surprise at the end. So I would highly suggest you tune in for that. Um, it's going to be same time next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, quite excited. Um, I can't That's tell you. Up. Yeah, I can't tell you more than that, but tune in. It's going to be great. Um, Patrick, yeah. anything else you'd like to leave uh, our viewers with? Um, no, I mean, other than I was just going to say that, you know, we we really appreciate any kind of feedback and uh, information that you guys can give us. I know I'm I know I'm in contact with a large portion of the community, but it, it's by no means all of it, you know, that's in this space. So uh, if you have ideas, suggestions, like this is by far never, you know, it's never the last version, right? <laughs> There's always more stuff to come. So if you have some other stuff, definitely uh, reach out and let us know. Um, we're, all, we're always up for uh, trying to make the product better. You can add us at Unreal Engine on Twitter, uh, but the best place for feedback is the feedback for the Unreal Engine team on our forums. That's uh, what I recommend. Absolutely. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Patrick, thanks again so much for coming on the stream. I hope to get to see you at some point again here. Um, yeah, in, in really. yeah I'd, I'd love to do it again, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and with that, I wish you all a great weekend and the re great rest of your week as well as a good weekend. And then I'll catch you all next week, same time, same day. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>